Um, I've been in the U.S. for the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, working on a bunch of things, a lot of uh, different startups. Uh, Ten years back, I did my first uh, mobile startup at, uh, called Covigo and uh, sold that to Symbol Technologies, which is now part of Motorola. And uh, I was uh, heading an engineering group at uh, Symbol, and I did that for two years and then quit and started Plusmo. So Plusmo is more about uh, uh, the consumer internet and you know, how to improve the user experience on mobile devices. And uh, we are doing that using widgets. So let me uh, introduce you guys to widgets. I mean, uh, I'm not going to uh, build anything here. I mean, I'm not going to build a widget, but but if you want to, we can try to do that uh, either on stage or offline. So the focus of my talk is going to be just to introduce all of you to widgets. Uh, from the last couple of years, we've been in Plusmo, and uh, a lot of cool things are happening in the mobile space. So I just wanted to inter introduce all of you guys to that. Um, how many of you here are uh, web developers? meaning people who can write JavaScript, or PHP, any of those sorts of things. Okay. So the, the, the thing about, uh, the thing when I, when I do this talk, I mean, I want you to walk away thinking that, you know, as long as you're a web developer, you can develop mobile widgets. And you don't have to learn Symbian, J2ME, you know, Windows Mobile, or Lime, or any such platform uh, in order to do a mobile widget. So that's the power of uh, widget. So we'll go over, you know, what, what exactly is a widget. I'm sure most of you know about widgets and have used them in the past. Um, but my, you know, my talk is mainly going to be about the mobile side of things. Um, the first part of the presentation is mainly to introduce all of you to widgets. And uh, we'll just try to see some cool demos. If uh, the technology is available, then we should be able to do some uh, demos. I mean, otherwise, uh, using the Airtel GPRS, I'll try to show you some demos uh, if the Wi-Fi is not available. Uh, you know, then we'll go into a business model section where, uh, you know, I'll just go over a little bit about how money is going to be made here. Um, and also the last part, which is cool stuff, building your own widget. So usage paradigms on the web are uh, evolving. I mean, you know, it started out you know, many years ago where people were just browsing websites. And then uh, people started uh, using search, and everybody uses search right now. Um, and then we saw things like, uh, you know, RSS. And uh, that's something where, you know, you don't even want to go search and you know, find stuff, but you have a standard set of things that you want to track, and uh, you, know, you just make those pieces of information come to you, right? So I'm sure that uh, everybody knows about RSS feed, right? Yes or no? Yes, okay, some of you. So basically, it's a way of getting uh, updates from your, you know, favorite websites to, uh, to, to your PC. And uh, widgets are something like that, you know. Um, for example, you know, you, you want to um, get the traffic or weather update. So right now, if you use a mobile device, you have to launch a browser. You have to put in a zip code. Actually, first you have to go to a URL, some particular website, let's say traffic.com or something like that, or weather, in the case of weather, let's say weather.com. So you have to enter something like that and go in. So that, that's a lot of steps. People just drop off after the first few steps. So a widget would allow you to personalize this kind of information and do it once and then remember that so that the next time onwards you would never have to uh, do that, you know, customize those things every time you get into the widget. So those are the sort of things that uh, widgets allow you to do. So again, what is a mobile widget? Right? So what am I talking about here? Right? So a mobile widget is a very thin application it resides on the device, and it is, it, it's a very specialized thing. So, you know, you can definitely use a mobile browser to do whatever you want. You can go browse the web, you know, you can use Google, or you can go to CNN, or Rediff, or uh, Crickinfo, any one of the sites that you visit, and get all the information. But a mobile widget is much more specific. I mean, it's specialized, so that you don't have to do a lot of tasks. Okay, so it doesn't do a lot of things, but each widget is uh, specialized and unique. Uh, for example, I mean, this is this is actually uh, Plusmo running on a mobile uh, device, the Nokia N95 here. So, you know, you, you see your uh, uh, base set of widgets. I mean, that's something that you've already personalized once, and it gives you some sort of a carousel view where you can actually go and uh, customize your widget. And um, you can, of course, go and... Uh, So 
So let's say, for example, you, know, you, you move around this way, you can actually get an instant snapshot of whatever you want. In this case, for example, there's a quick info Bobicast widget, and that gives you the IPL latest scores. I mean, I generated these slides about three or four days back. So you see the May 17th results between uh, Kings and uh, Daredevils, right? Or, you know, if you want to get something else like a beauty tip or something like that, or a daily horoscope, all of these things are little widgets that give you. So the important thing here is, you know, without even uh, launching the browser, without actually uh, doing a lot of steps, you get content instantly on your device. So that's what a mobile widget enables you to do. So things like, you know, all your favorites, um, you know, it's always well formatted, it gives you bite-sized information, and uh, it's always on. There's, uh, there's no waiting. So in this particular case, for example, this piece of information was downloaded maybe 10 minutes before you launched it. So it's downloading information in the background. Um, you know, information is being pushed to the phone over GPRS uh, in very, very small, compressed, bite-sized chunks. And, um, you know, that's what is already there. So you don't have to wait for the data to be, uh, you know, being downloaded, you know, while you're looking at the application. So that's the whole idea here. And, you know, widgets can be pretty much anything. You know, you can have social apps, like, you know, you can have a, uh, you know, a widget for, for you know, your, uh, Facebook or Orford or anything like that, tracking all the things that your friends are doing. Uh, you can have widgets for utilities like currency converters or search and, uh, you know, videos, news, RSS feeds, pretty much anything. So a few more examples of widgets here. I mean, uh, one of the popular widgets that we have on uh, Plusmo is a cartoon viewer. Um, you know, this is something like, you know, there are already uh, feeds available for most cartoons, and this is like the official Dilbert RSS feed. So this little widget, all it does is, you know, it takes cartoons and uh, shows it to you uh, in a way which is very convenient for you to see. So in fact, I have all of these uh, uh, widgets, so maybe we can, uh, you know, go over them offline. And uh, the second one, let me see. The other one also was supposed to animate. animate. But anyway, uh, so the important thing is that uh, this particular one here, the uh, Rick Info Mobicast widget, this is one of the most uh, popular widgets on Plusmo. I mean, it gets more than uh, 6 to 10 million uh, page views. Uh, I mean, you, you all can imagine because, you know, cricket fever is very high. And, you know, we do get about 30% of our traffic for this from, from India. But the important thing is, you know, that, that whole thing is a JavaScript, XHTML, CSS-based application that any one of you can develop. Okay, that's the power of widgets. So all of you can uh, you know, develop these sorts of apps. Okay. Go to the next. Okay. So most phones uh, can um, show widgets today. Okay. So for example, um, uh, you know, th there are phones like uh, the the iPhone. I mean, everybody knows that when you look at it, you just see a bunch of widgets on the front, right? Uh, so iPhone has a basic sort of uh, web flipping model where they do have some sort of widget. But uh, the most uh, powerful phone in terms of uh, being able to support widgets today, I mean, in my view, is the uh, N95. So the Nokia N95 has a built-in uh, widget engine called as the Web Runtime Widget Engine. So if you have the latest version of the Nokia N95, you will be able to see widgets. And that's kind of the, the phone that I was, uh, uh, I was going to demo. And... Uh, uh, we'll anyway take a look at that. So, so, so you know, so, so there's two kinds of phones, right? One is, you know, either it ha already has a native widget runtime, so that's the N95. But suppose there's a phone that does not have a widget runtime, and that's where, um, you know, for example, Plusmo has a widget engine. There are a lot of companies like Plusmo who have widget engines. So you can download it off the air, and you can build your widgets, and you can get the same sort of experience on older phones. So Plusmo has a widget engine that we support on uh, pretty much every sort of mobile platform. So we're a you know, small venture-funded startup, so we're starting out. So 
as you can imagine, it's you know you start off with Java, then you port it to Windows and Brew, and then Limo and Android, and you know the platforms are endless. But you know we are on our way to have a widget engine for um, every one of those uh, platforms. Okay. So one thing to look at is you know, what is a widget really composed of, right? So I mentioned that you know you have multiple sort of uh, you know mobile operating systems or you know virtual machines or whatever uh, you might call these things, right? Like Java, for example, is a VM, and uh, Symbian and Windows are mobile operating systems. Uh, so there's a widget runtime. Uh, as I mentioned, it could either be something that the phone already gives you, or it's something that uh, you, know, you download over the air and use. And then on top of that, you would install these widgets on the phone. So widgets are basically like web apps. Okay, so it's HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, and then there is some resource bundle in which you use images and media and that sort of stuff. Uh, and then there is something called a widget manifest file. Okay, so the widget ma manifest file is the one that tells the uh, widget runtime some information about this widget. Like, for example, the name, uh, some sort of an ID, what is the short description that you want to give it, any parameters that you might want to pass. All of those things are in the widget.xml file. That's that's something that is also a standard. There's a W3C committee working on that. So pretty soon you'll see that even that will become a standard. Okay. So on the client side, it's all of these uh, files bundled together. And uh, and the other big thing is a widget uh, runtime engine will give you the ability to make uh, remote calls either synchronously or asynchronously. So it's like um, uh, asynchronous JavaScript calls, like an XML HTTP call. So a widget runtime will typically allow you to do that. Even if you have a browser-based widget, uh, the browser should support it so that you, know, you, can, you can actually uh, use uh, and build interesting stuff. Uh, and then, you know, like any other web app, there's also a server side. So the server side is the widget data service. So that's your hosted service. You know, you run it on Apache or uh, you know, any sort of web server that you want. Uh, you, know, you can use uh, XML or uh, either SOAP or REST or whatever you want. And uh, it could also be JSON. Uh, so all of those things are fine. Um, so, so for example, if you have a weather widget, you will have a weather web service, and then you know you pull information from that and uh, update it on the device. So it's very similar to a web app. The only difference is that it's bundled and it resides on the client. So the big thing about widgets is convenience and ease of use, right? So even though uh, I may not be able to uh, project that or, or show it effectively from there, so you know these are all the widgets that are. Uh, these are all the widgets that I've put on my front screen, right? So these are like, you know, there's a, there's a blog, there's my uh, favorite uh, golf app, and I can get the golf leaderboard. There's, of course, uh, Quick Info, MobyCat, and uh, Google News, and like an NFL application. So all of those applications are right there. So it's one click, right? So you don't have to go where finding, you know, where is the browser, what's the website, do you think they'll support something on WAP? So all of those questions are not there when you're using widgets, right? So the idea is that you know you click on it and you instantly get information. So this is one of the golf widgets that uh, uh, we've made uh, you know, from Plusmo, and you know this, this works on an N95 or uh, pretty much any any device actually. Um, the other thing is that you know if if the widget platform allows an offline mode, you can actually download all the data, and um, there will be some extra JavaScript APIs that you will have to actually store the data on the device. Okay, so that's very useful. Uh, you, know, you would be able to download information like the leaderboard five minutes ago. So when the user tries to click on this application, it's instantly available. So all of these things that I'm talking about are things that would make it really easy for users to use, and that's the whole purpose of uh, you know doing this. I mean, otherwise this is exactly same as what you could see in a browser, right? So far. Uh, and also, you know, you should uh, also build things like these informational pop-ups uh, or you know. When that pop-up happens, you can also buzz the phone. You can access the phone speaker and buzz it, so that you know you can have the phone in your pocket, like you have your N95 in your pocket, and uh, you're not tracking the game, really looking at it uh, ball by ball or play by play. But then you know when something happens, it buzzes the phone or plays a theme song of that team or something like that, you know, just, just to alert you. So those are all the cool things that uh, you can do with widgets. 
there are a lot of uh, cool widget use cases, okay? So um, mm -hmm. many of these phones today have things like accelerometers. So you know, you can actually move the you can actually move the phone, and then you can you can get those events into your application. So widget platforms will give you those sorts of APIs in JavaScript. So in JavaScript, you have those APIs, so you get callbacks, and you can directly use them, right? In fact, actually, let me walk down and try to do a demo. Here. I get it. Uh -huh. So as I showed you, right, these are all the these are all the widgets that I have installed. Um, but let me just show you one. I mean, this was not something that was built on Plus Four. Uh, it was already there on the phone. But look at this. See? Yeah. I'm moving the phone, and then you know you can, yeah, you can play paddle ball or whatever you want. Yeah? So there's already a built-in accelerometer, and uh, you can you can access these sorts of things directly. So, so if you want to build a widget uh, or an application like this, I mean, does it really require you to know Symbian, C++, Java, uh, G2ME, and all of that, or can you do it just with JavaScript? And that's the power of what uh, widgets will give you. By the way, those were all the other widgets that I've uh, installed. So lots of cool use cases, you know, you, you, I mean, with location, for example, you know, you, you get on a plane, uh, you land in Delhi, automatically uh, you know, your phone detects that, and uh, today you get an SMS. As soon as you land from a plane, there will be 100 SMSs hitting everybody's phones. So what if uh, it could go a little bit more further than that, right? So what if you could uh, make sure that all of your widgets are location aware and you know, whatever you want to find, all your local services are uh, directly available. So those are the sort of things that you know, widgets will open up. You know, so far, you know, with just a web app, it would be just JavaScript. But for all of these sorts of things, you know, if you want to take a picture and upload it, take a video and upload it, today all of these use cases require some sort of uh, Java coding or some sort of Symbian coding. So with the power of uh, a widget platform, you'll be able to do that all from JavaScript. So Plusmo, you know, we, we did this a uh, couple of years back where we launched it, and uh, you know, we have we also did another thing. Okay, so before we um, had a widget platform which had uh, you know uh, developers being able to use JavaScript and build it, we said let's make a few web wizards. So if you are a publisher or if you are a blogger or if you are a, uh, just a topical expert, you could just go to Plusmo.com and say you know click a few links through a wizard. And uh, you know, beyond that, you can get a widget, right? So there's about 20 to 30,000 of these uh, widgets. So 20 to 30,000 different websites or publishers have used the service and made uh, widgets out of them. Uh, all of these are, you know, a simple pattern. So one pattern, which is, uh, you know, it takes an RSS feed or a media RSS feed, then it parses out all the media. Um, if there is uh, pictures, it would become a picture sort of widget. If there's podcast, you get a podcast widget. Videos, you get a video one. But then it's all very similar. So you know, you can users can come match up whatever content they want from different sorts of uh, websites and uh, make a topical widget. So there's a lot of people who you know use Plusmo to do that also. And uh, you know, by default, what we do is we generate um, all of these widgets for uh, you know every sort of device. Uh, you know, today I mean we support more than uh, six or seven hundred devices. And the reason why we can do that is that we are standards based, right? And so you will get the same if you're uh, using the Nokia N95 and building widgets on that because you know it's a, it's a standard platform. You don't need to learn anything else except the JavaScript or uh, XHTML, CSS, or SVG. It's exactly the same standards that you would do for uh, web development. So I mean, you know, you, there are widgets pretty much for anything that you want to. Um, Anything that you want to do, right? I'm sure there'll be widgets that come. All of these are widgets that are already there um, that Plusmo has built. Uh, you know, they work for the N95. Okay, they also work on uh, Plusmo for devices that don't have a widget platform. Um, you know, if you if you look at a widget like this, for example, it's a world clock, and uh, if you want to show something like a, a clock face, which is actually ticking, right? So then you know, you need to have some sort of uh, vector graphics to actually draw those lines. 
So all of these are things that a uh, widget platform can give you. So you can use FVG uh, to actually do line drawing, art, busier curve, points, and those sorts of things, right? Um, Whole hunt game there. Is this dead or is it okay? It's okay. So the game that's in the back. Um, so that that also requires some sort of scalable vector graphics. So that, you know, if you want to write games, you can still do that. So you can even write games as long as they don't have too much of animation going, right? So that's when you will need to uh, do more native stuff. I'll come I'll come to a point where I'll talk about when you will do a widget versus when you would do native coding. So that's really all I had uh, in terms of introduction to widgets, right? So I have a few slides on, um, you know, whether money is going to be made on this and how money is going to be made, and you know, will operators be interested in that sort of stuff? So we'll uh, go through those slides. Okay. So you know, these days, if you look at the trends, right? I mean, there's you know four different stakeholders that I've put here, right? There's the, there's the users. And users, like I said, you know, they, they're moving from, you know, browsing for information to searching for that to actually subscribing to information. So users are getting more demanding in terms of what they want on their uh, phone, right? So it's not just a phone. You want much more uh, on, on the phone, just, not just a voice device, okay? And then publishers, are like, like brands and publishers, they're looking to extend their reach, right? So they want a, a button on... Um, uh, um, Somebody wants a button, like let's say, for example, the BBC. BBC will want to have a button called BBC on the phone. So it extends their reach and you know, they are directly there on the phone as a button. So publishers want those sorts of uh, features and widgets can offer that, right? And then operators are looking to you know, extend uh, more and more data services so that they can, uh, uh, you know, they can add more value added services. If you look at uh, countries like the US, most of the voice calling is all bundled. I mean, it's almost. Uh, uh, part of your base package. Nobody looks at uh, minutes unless you're crossing two or three thousand minutes a month, right? So calling uh, friends and family is free, and then you know if you have the same provider give you a cable plan and a uh, and a DSL plan and a voice line on the uh, you know a landline and the cell phone line, so they're bundling all these things. So you know their average revenue per user is actually um, reducing if it is just based on those services. So they're definitely looking to add more and more interesting services. So operators are all interested uh, in these sorts of new services that are, you know, that users like. And then, you know, developers, right? So the great part about widgets is that, you know, as a developer, you can just, you know, go home today and start building a widget. There's nothing that you need to learn because you already know JavaScript, you already know all of the stuff on the web. So all of these things are all the good things that are going for uh, widgets. So traditionally, I mean, how does this uh, value chain work? I mean, you have publishers. Um, publishers have content, and uh, let's say you want to sell that content, whatever it is, is it a ringtone or a wallpaper or uh, something better? You know, you go through aggregators. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see. In, in in India, maybe an aggregator would be somebody like Hangama. So they would aggregate, uh, you know, a lot of content and uh, have operator deals, and the operators will distribute it on deck. So, you know, you, as a user, you go to the operator's uh, web portal, and then you get that information, right? So that's that's a model that's working. It's great for, uh, especially for the operators, it's pretty good. And uh, and that model is what is working today. With the off-deck uh, distribution model, what that means is that, you know, you're not really, um, you're not really going on the operator's deck. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in a case study that, that Frick Info, right? For example, um, people who use uh, this uh, Cricket uh, widget that we have, they download it from Frick Info directly on their web, right? So they go to you know, ci.plusmo.com from their N95 or any sort of device that they have, and then they download that widget. So they never go to uh, the operator's homepage and find it there. So as they're browsing on their PC, they find something, and then it just directly goes and... Um, um, you know, shows up on your phone. 
And you know, we, we are getting uh, a number of downloads like that where you know somebody who is very interested in uh, a particular brand's website, they'll just go there and they download it. So this is you know yet another. I mean, I'm not saying that this is going to disappear at all. I mean, this is the primary um, model where uh, things are being distributed. But the off-deck download model is something that's growing, and uh, that will continue to rise up. And um, you know, the, the other thing that uh, you will see here is that you know. Publishers can host widgets, and that's that's what I mentioned. Where Crickinfo actually hosts a widget, and users go to Crickinfo's website and download it, rather than going to you know Airtel Home, right? Um, and developers can build mashups. You know, you put together something from two or three different sources, you host it on your own website or blog, and uh, any user who hits that from their um, you know their uh, phone's browser can get a choice to install a widget, and they can install it. So that's a different model. So what is the basic requirement? The basic requirement is a data plan, right? So it's it's almost like uh, uh, you know you're using a, a free bandwidth data pipe from the operator, and you're pretty much going and doing whatever you want to. And that's how it is on the web, right? I mean, so you don't actually pay your uh, DSL provider to do your online banking. So I mean, you know, you just go hit a website and you do it. It's the same thing is going to, you know. It may happen on phones. I mean, it just depends on the operators, how protective they are. Um, and if there are some operators who allow this, they will uh, they will allow it. Some people might block it. So that, that's still up in the air. So you know, just to give you an idea, more than 100 or 120 um, operators, um, uh, I mean, I see traffic from more of them. I mean, I, you know, on plusmo.com, I, I get about uh, 40,000 different user agents every month. Um, and uh, all of these come from you know hundreds of operators worldwide. So you know pretty much as long as you have a data plan, you should be able to access widgets. And you know the other thing is also you know if you build some interesting widgets like this cricket stuff or uh, anything that really uh, you know uh, provides some really compelling service, normal people who would never have got a data plan otherwise will say that yeah you know I want it I want a data plan I mean I want that widget and I'm going to buy a cricket phone. So that's the sort of uh, thing where the application defines the use case for a user to buy a phone, right? a special type of phone. So you'll see more of these kinds of things. And again, all of that is up to you guys to build coolest widgets that you know, people want. So this is one of the successful widgets the, on uh, plusmo.com. Um, so it's, it offers ball by ball uh, uh, cricket commentary for users. Uh, anybody with um, any sort of uh, data plan can access it. It, it um, works on over uh, 600 to 1,000 different uh, types of phones, right? And um, the monetization for this is via advertisements, okay? So, you know, like we have a deal with, uh, you know, Cricket Info. So um, the, the way we monetize is with putting advertisements somewhere in the widget. At this time, you know, we are, we are gathering users, but at some point we'll, uh, you know, we'll start turning on ads. So it's free to the user. No, users don't have to pay for this. Especially, it's uh, it's part of your uh, um, data plan. I mean, you just you just pay for your GPRS, and that's it. And uh, generates millions of page views for us. I mean, uh, um, definitely a good ad-worthy uh, widget. Okay. Okay. So you know this is just an interesting uh, stat that I wanted to put out here. So Plusmo has a lot of uh, traffic from widgets. So we we get millions of uh, widget page views from all over the world. I mean, if you look at the traffic from India, it's it's kind of considerable, and all of that is uh, uh, you know from data providers like Airtel um, and uh, you know Vodafone, and um, you know people would have already got a good device like like a data device and. They already have a GPRS plan, and they just uh, hit plusmo.com and download these things. So all of these are widgets, you know. So if you look at this particular, uh, for example, the MTV News widget, right? So you will see some advertisements there. So that's the sort of way that you know you can embed uh, advertisements in, inside of a widget. And uh, well, the actual uh, CPMs for mobile ads are uh, it varies a lot. So you know you can get uh, quotes from one dollar. For every thousand ad impressions to twenty dollars, depending on you know who you talk to, right? So there's banners, there's impressions on mobile. You can also do click to call, and you can also do uh, click to purchase. 
And you know, widgets are all very specialized, right? Like for example, when we did the cricket widget, um, and uh, we had our audience in the US, okay, and uh, some part of our audience in the US, and also in the UK, people wanted to put advertisements uh, targeting NRIs. So for those, I mean, if, if there's a builder in India who wants to put an advertisement targeting uh, people in the US, I mean, if something happens, you, know, you get quite a lot of money for it, right? Like if there's a transaction that is triggered because somebody saw this particular ad, that's almost like a click to purchase. So you get a very high um, ad value from those sorts of things. So when you build a widget and it's very specialized, then you know, your, your CPMs get to be very high. So it's, it's very promising. As long as you can get enough number of users using your widget, it's definitely promising to do advertisements. And that not, that's not to mention that you can't do subscri subscription-based models, right? So for example, some of the Plusmo widgets uh, that we've built, they're live on uh, T-Mobile in the US. And uh, they're actually paid. Users pay a few dollars a month to access live uh, uh, NFL play-by-play, -play, for example, okay? So that, that, that's, that's something that is not something that I'm saying that it's only going to be advertisements with widgets. So sometimes operators will come to you and say that I want that widget on my deck and I want to sell it and uh, you, know, you offer it up. The same as um, you know, any uh, mobile app. Okay, so now more into the developing widgets part. Okay, so this is the final part. Um, okay, but before we you know, go into that, right, I wanted to compare different sort of um, development methodologies, right? So you can either do native uh, mobile development on Windows Mobile, uh, Mobile Linux, Symbian C++, pretty much any of the um, you know, native either open or closed operating systems. I mean, if you're working for uh, some companies where there are operating systems which are very uh, phone specific and they're not like these, I mean, I'm sure that I don't know many operating systems that are here that uh, you, you guys probably know if you're working on, in a mobile company. But there are many of those, right? So that's developing on that. That will typically be in either assembly or C, uh, or you know, sometimes even Java. But it will most likely be C when you deal with that level. And then you know, there are virtual machines. You know, there's Java, there's J2M, EVM, different sorts of profiles, CLDC 1.1. Uh, companies like uh, BlackBerry have their own profile. Um, you know, Google, for example, has a different version of uh, Java on Android. So all of these are where there's a VM. Right? And for example, the N95 has all of these and also Python. Uh, so all of those are different ways of building. And then there's widgets that I'm talking about, which is using uh, HTML, CSS for your descriptive markup and uh, JavaScript for your coding, right? So the differences are, one is if you, one axis is application complexity, right? So if you're building something like a video codec or if you're doing uh, front screen in integration or some sort of OpenGL game which is really intense, you're building a racing game that has a lot of 3D textures, definitely don't do a widget, right? You, you do it native so that you, know, you have full uh, power of the uh, you know, hardware acceleration APIs that you have. I mean, you could probably pass it over to JavaScript, but you know, a lot of things would be gone in the translation, right? Uh, if you're doing things like a, a lot of action games where you know, you're hitting the keys and it needs to really react very fast, uh, but you, know, you don't really need a lot of uh, hardware things, then you can still do it in Java and Brew. So that's why you know, those things are very popular for games, right? And then widgets, yeah, I mean, you, you can do thing, things like you know, any of the social uh, things like you know, I want to build a, an Orkut widget that tracks all my friends or tracks my scraps or whatever they call them, uh, or a, Facebook widget, or you know, you want to do something where it's a threaded SMS reader, or um, any of these infotainment things, mashups, maps, all of those sorts of web apps, you can definitely do it as a widget, right? So, in terms of the development, right? So this is obviously the hardest, right? I mean, so you will have to know, uh, you know, internals of the phone, how to compile it, what is the tool, you know, do I use, uh, you know, Visual C++ or Carbide or MetroWorks Code Warrior or what kind of tool set do I need? What are the binaries? How do I deploy it? All of those things are things that you, you need to really figure out. So the, if you look at the ease of development access, widgets are obviously the easiest because you already know everything that you need to know with uh, HTML and JavaScript, right? And obviously the number of developers also, if you look at 
people who know native mobile development to people who know JavaScript. I mean, there's a huge uh, difference, right? So, uh, you know, if, if, I'm sure that if I have a show of hands, it will be something like this, where there will be many people with uh, JavaScript knowledge, um, you know, web development knowledge. But that could also be because today is the web day. But in any case, uh, if you look at the absolute population, you'll see more people uh, knowing, uh, you know, web, web standards. So that's the thing that is attractive about uh, widgets. Okay. The, okay, the one big thing here is that uh, for it to actually work where you already know everything about it, standards are very important, okay? So the W3C, for example, has a widget 1.0 uh, draft spec. Um, so at Plusmo, we, we definitely comply to that, okay? And then the, the N95 device, for example, is one of the best devices that you can actually get started with uh, widget development. So, you know, I would, I mean, if you, if you have one of those devices or can get one of them, I would recommend that, uh, you know, you, you start with an N95 um, with the built-in uh, web runtime. So that's you know, fully standards-based. The markup is XHTML. Uh, MP means mobile profile. So XHTML, MP, or you know, full HTML. The style is uh, CSS, scripting using JavaScript. It has a... Um, uh, manifest file and that also is those are the ones that you need to stick with I mean there are a lot of uh, you know intermediate platforms for mobile devices uh, there is there's, there's many of them you know uh, probably like uh, 50 plus but the ones that matter are the ones that are standards compliant because otherwise you are you're learning somebody else's another markup language okay so you need to stick with just the standards, right? So otherwise, you know, it's, it's really a waste of time. I mean, it's, it's as good as uh, programming it in Java or C++. If you have to go and learn somebody else's XML language to actually build a widget, right? So standards are very important. So whenever you pick a platform, stick with uh, the ones that have standard support. Okay, so when you wanna get started building a widget, it's, it's really pretty easy. But uh, if you wanna get some primers, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, good documentation uh, at uh, Forum Nokia. Okay, so um, so the the reason I'm kind of uh, um, talking about that is because that's one of the first phones in the market that actually has a widget platform that's built in. So you don't really need to do anything. So you need to uh, just get the phone with that particular OS, and I hope that you know uh, you will be able to get that in India. Uh, so that's a Series 60 third edition feature pack two, to be exact. So you might want to make a note of that. So as long as you have a device that supports that, then uh, you, you're all set to go. All you need is uh, you know, a PC with uh, an internet connection and uh, Apache or some sort of open source web server and you can host, build your widgets and uh, connect to it from your phone and you're all set to go. There are a lot of other devices. Um, if you go to uh, the Series 60 website, I mean, you, they'll give you a good uh, breakdown of all the different devices. I mean. Um, Series 60 is a, a mobile platform that's actually licensed out to many devices, right? So it's it's not um, it is not marketed as a Nokia uh, thing, right? So it's S60. So S60 is also on, for example, the Samsung SGH. The same S60 is also on uh, LG devices. So you, you could get any one of those devices, and they support widgets natively. And if they don't, uh, you could always uh, use. Uh, uh, a widget engine like Plusmo, and you know, and then you can do that also. But uh, also, want to mention to you that whatever I've shown you in terms of this, the Plusmo side of things, it's something that we are launching. Um, it's it's not yet launched. I mean, you probably are the first guys who are actually seeing that. So, uh, if you really want to develop, you can also send me an email. Mine mine is there, and I'll I'll uh, definitely advise you guys on how to get started. There are a lot of good starting points here. So. There's also another concept, right? Like if you have already built a widget on the web and if you put it on, uh, let's say, Apple's widget gallery or uh, Yahoo widget gallery, and if you want to get it on a mobile device, there are even tips on how to port those widgets to your uh, mobile side of things. And you will, if you look at that, you'll see that it's pretty easy. I mean, there's not much that you need to do. Um, you know, except when you want to use things like, which is uh, specific for phone, right? Like if you want to use, uh, 
uh, the keys on the phone, like, you know, I want to have uh, shortcut keys to actually navigate. Or if you want to do something specific on the phone, like use the soft keys, or you want to buzz the speaker, or uh, you want to use the accelerator, accelerometer. All of these things are specific APIs. But otherwise, porting from any web widget that you have into a mobile widget should be pretty straightforward. Okay. So building your first widget, right? What do you need to do? So first, build a working prototype on a PC. Okay, so use, uh, uh, you, know, you, you know, you could use any browser uh, to test it out, IE, Firefox, Safari, whatever you want, okay? Um, Firebug is one, uh, you know, plugin that many of you who are uh, into JavaScript may have used. So obviously you can use something like that to debug all your, uh, you know, XML, HTTP calls, your net traffic, uh, seeing what the delays are, and uh, all of those sorts of things. You can use Firebug to check it out. So once you're happy with it, all you need to do is bundle all the client-side files into one, one zip file. So just use WinZip or WinDRAR or whatever your favorite zip utility is, and then you zip it up. And then you need to add a widget manifest file. So the widget manifest file is something like this. So this is a widget manifest. So all you need to do is modify the things in red, right? You name your widget, you put a unique identifier for the widget. You know, there could be many Hello World widgets, so this is an identifier for the widget runtime on the phone to know what the specific uh, widget is, right? And then this one is your main HTML page that the widget points to. When the widget launches, that's where it needs to come. You might have, you might have just one HTML file in your widget, or you might have three or four. Um, and you know, what is the main file that needs to show up when you hit the widget, and that's that one. And then this is one of those permission things where you're allowing the widget to do network access. So you do that, give it a version, and that's it. So this is the widget manifest file. So you have the widget manifest file, you have all your other things which are all the same, which is, uh, you know, your, XM, your uh, JavaScript, CSS, resources, images, whatever you want to bundle, right? You rename the zip file to a WGZ file, WGZ is the extension for a widget file on the N95, and uh, it's one of, so, so it's one of the uh, compression standards that is uh, recommended by W3C. So it's all very standard. So the W3C recommends that you use one of GZIP or ZIP to compress all your files, and you have a widget uh, manifest file. So all of those things are pretty standard. So there is no uh, this particular markup that you see here that I showed you, it's not some, some XML that is new and you know, I'm, I'm asking you to learn or something like that. It's, it's, it's a standard that uh, the W3C is defining. So, so far we're all good with standards there. And then you host it on a web server, browse to it from your PC, and then you're done. I mean, like it downloads it and it installs itself as a, uh, um, an application. And then, you know, the, the, the good thing about the N95 is that, you know, all of these widgets show up on the shell. So that means, you know, it's as good as any other GTOMing application that uh, you, might have, you might have built, where, you know, you, you can actually add it as a shortcut to your front screen and uh, one-click access to all your uh, info from there. Okay. So that, that's about it in terms of... Uh, uh, how to build a widget, okay? So I'm not going to go build a widget here, but it's, it's, it's so simple that, you know, you can, as long as you have a JavaScript uh, and HTML sort of knowledge, you can build it yourself. So I suggest that, you know, you, you, you sign up for uh, something like Forum Nokia, you go there and they have a lot of documents, you can just pick it up and uh, it, it won't take you more than two hours to build your, uh, you know, you build your widgets and get them on your phone and play with them. So it's, it's as simple as that. So if you want to build complex widgets, which have a lot of, uh, you know, background threading and, uh, you know, background sort of uh, uh, access on uh, with networks and, you know, a lot of parsing, that's where you will run into trouble. And that's where we also ran into a lot of trouble. Because, you know, there are no um, debugging tools for widgets right now. It, it, it's something that is still uh, a new and evolving area. So you don't, you don't have the ability to actually have an emulator which is running on a PC, and it gives you all of those APIs, like, you know, if you want to buzz the phone, 
you know, I have an emulator uh, running inside Firefox or, you know, like an IE browser, which actually tells me whether my API call to buzz the phone is correct or not. So you don't have things like that. So you will have some sort of uh, issues around that. So the best way to do this is to debug everything using Firebug, keep it all, um, uh, you know, without the mobile APIs and then add some of the mobile things later. That's the only way that I've seen that works best. Okay. Finally, I mean, the, the most important thing about mobile widgets is you, know, you, you need to deal with some of these mobile specific things, right? So one is the screen size. Okay, so you know, if you look at the, all of these phones here, right? I mean, they have different sort of modes. They have accelerometers and uh, even the same phone will, uh, will have the same widget it needs to be supported in uh, two different modes, okay, like a portrait mode or a landscape mode, right? So these are what some of the things that, where you will have to innovate and come up with uh, techniques to actually uh, draw scalable images, draw scalable things on your phone, and even still make it look good, right? So like, for example, that's, that's my weather widget. And uh, in order to make sure that that little tooltip sort of thing scales, you have to do some tricks inside the platform to actually make it happen, right? So if you just have a fixed image as the background, then you know, it won't scale, right? So screen sizes is one thing, right? The other big thing is bandwidth usage, right? So if you just had a web page and you are always going to you know, refresh the web page, um, usually what happens is the whole page gets downloaded. So if you're watching uh, cricket, and you know, or any sort of game, and you know, every time you want to know what's the next uh, ball going to be, so you keep hitting refresh. So remember that every time you hit refresh, the whole web page starts getting downloaded again each time, right? So with widgets, you have a much better solution where you can only download the data. Okay, so you can only download, you know, what you uh, really need, and uh, so I suggest that you know you you optimize your uh, bandwidth usage to make sure that. Uh, you, you use compression protocols. If the browser supports gzip, use gzip. If not, implement something in JavaScript that can read a small binary stream, send binary data to the device so that, uh, you know, um, the traffic that comes over the net is very, very small. Okay, so, you know, you can do things like caching images locally. Don't keep refetching them. So all the same tricks that you would do, but, you know, you didn't really care about this on the web side of things because you have a big connection and everything is good with your PC. You have a gigabit pipe, so you don't really care about these things. But on a mobile device, whether you're building a widget or any other mobile app, all of these things are pretty important. And uh, even with widgets, they are important, right? And the other thing is, you know, don't do things like, you know, uh, where, you know, it, it has some sort of uh, mode where it keeps refetching stuff from the server and uh, accessing a lot of uh, the battery. So, you know, you will be draining the battery. So the last thing someone wants is uh, to load your widget, and load your application, and uh, half an hour later, the phone is dead. So you definitely don't want something like that, right? So you have to be careful as, as a widget developer to, uh, to know that you don't do that. And you know, uh, widget platforms like Plusmo, we actually scan for malicious code, okay? So we actually uh, compile JavaScript on the server side before we make a widget out of it. That's kind of how we do it. So we actually scan and make sure that uh, there is nothing malicious. Uh, that you're trying to do in a widget. And that's part of the submission process when you submit a widget. But if the platform doesn't have that, that burden is on the developer. So you guys as developers should make sure that you don't do, um, you know, you don't actually strain the device and uh, do a lot of computation and, you know, it, it kills the battery. Okay, and, and also, you know, the, when you're building a widget, you have to make it personalized, right? So when I'm looking at this particular weather here, right, it took me three steps, or well, actually just one step to go there and put Bangalore, India, and then after that, you know, my widget is showing me Bangalore weather, right? I don't really need to uh, every time remember these sorts of things, right? And if, if I had a location API, I didn't even need to enter that. It should directly figure out that I'm in Bangalore and give Bangalore weather, right? So those are the sort of things that you need to add for personalization so that users can directly get uh, one click, uh, one click access to their uh, stuff. I mean, don't make the users do a lot of work when you're building uh, any app, not just widgets, I'm sure, with any app, right? 
And then, you know, you need to reduce the need for typing. So this is the thing that kills any mobile app, right? If you, if you have to type a lot of things, you know, people drop off. You know, we've learned from a lot of mistakes in our past. I mean, if you, if you download Plasmo today 2.0, uh, you know, it's probably going to ask you a lot of questions and make you type, and you know, I'm sure we lose users there, right? So those are all the things that we are also learning. But the, the idea is to make sure that you, you make it really easy for users, and only then it's, it's going to fly. So with widgets, you have that uh, opportunity. Couple of other things. Um, well, I haven't covered this, but you know, I can uh, I can talk about this. One is, you know, th there will be widget security models. Okay, so uh, because you have access to some internals of the phone, like for example, uh, the backlight, you can you know turn on the backlight or turn it off. So that's what I mean by killing the battery, right? So if you keep the backlight on forever on the phone, which you can do with a widget API, then you know after some time your phone will die, right? So the, the battery will discharge. So so how do you check that? I mean, who, whose responsibility is it to check? I mean, is it the developer? Is it the widget platform? Is it the operator? Is it the user? So all of those different sorts of uh, uh, questions are things that uh, you know, we deal with when we, when we talk to operators or device manufacturers um, at Plasmo. So you know, some of those things are all uh, evolving. But, um, but it's, uh, it's safe to say that you know, it, it will be very similar to the Java security model where a widget developer can ask for permissions and either the user um, or the operator or the device manufacturer can actually control that. Right? So that's on the security side of things. Uh, there will also be premium widgets distributed by operators when operators launch these sorts of uh, content distribution networks for widgets. And uh, there, you know, you do need to deal with billing and integration with operators, just like you would do. And typically, the widget platform can do a, a lot of those things. And then, you know, uh, this is something that um, um, we don't deal with at Plasmo, which is enterprise widgets, right? So maybe there could be a widget where you, you, know, you have your bank account, just like your website. If there's a need for it to be a widget, then, you know, uh, it, it will be built. But uh, we, we're not dealing with that, that side of things, and we're only doing more... more uh, on the fun side of things, where it's uh, users getting, um, you know, little applications just to entertain them, and uh, just to you know, uh, use them. But you know, the enterprise side of things is also something that uh, uh, is very promising. Uh, what do you define by uh, change? So, so here the question is whether uh, whether we can build a cha change resilient widget. So I'm trying to understand what is that change. Okay. 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 So. Okay, the question is, you know, what if a website changes and, uh, you know, does the widget have to change? Uh, definitely not. I mean, that only happens if you're scraping the website to get your data. You know, if you use an API, like let's say, for example, you want to build a uh, weather widget or uh, you want to build a traffic widget. Uh, typically, uh, the way we do it is not by going and scraping uh, a website to get that information, right? It's typically, you know, we, we have a deal with a content provider. So, for example, uh, you know, Plusmo, we, we pay a lot of money to content providers who give us uh, feeds. These feeds are XML feeds that are uh, specially uh, made for us. And so, like, for example, ESPN Crick Info. There are special feeds that we get from them after every ball. There's a team at Crick Info who, who would uh, probably enter ball by ball commentary. And uh, that data comes to us within uh, 10 seconds of an event happening. And so that sort of feed never changes. I mean, the website can change, but these things uh, don't really change. Thanks. Sorry? Uh, we are told that feeds are received and been passed. Right. So the feeds are received at the widget client application end, or you show that we have a data service okay. at the server end. So okay. they pass and give you the exact data. So that's, a, that's, that's also a good question. So the question is, you know, whether the feeds that come from the content provider, do they come on the, uh, pro to the server or directly to the client? So, you know, um, it depends on, your, uh, depends on your widget. So in the case of sports, okay, in the case of these uh, 
you know, highly used widgets, right? So we have a server that actually takes care of all of these things on the server side. Uh, for example, we do a lot of things, like whenever you have uh, users accessing these services, we don't run that code on any VM. No Java, no PHP, no Python, there is nothing running on the server. No, 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 what I'm saying is on the server side, there is no uh, VM running to execute any sort of thing, right? So as soon as the data comes to the server, it's, uh, it's parsed, and then an HTML fragment or a, an XML fragment is saved, or JSON is actually generated and saved. So, and those files are all cached, um, you know, with Apache or any sort of web server. So there's no real going on when a, when, in the critical path when a user comes in, right? So you need to do a lot of background processing to, to make your service scalable. What was that? No, no, it has nothing to do with the operator. It has nothing to do with the operator. It's a data service. Sorry? It means the widgets always talk to your data service. Yes. It won't directly, so it, uh, who will configure the data service? The widget uh, developer will configure the data service yeah, to be used? Yeah, you as a widget developer will have to take care of the data service for the widget. So it's not uh, somewhere location centric. It should be accessible wherever the widget is getting used. That's right. I mean, it's a, uh, so, you know, we have data centers with, uh, you know, 10 to 100 megabit pipes okay. where, uh, you know, like people coming from India access it and everything is fine, right? So, okay, it's your uh, yeah. uh, your own hosted data service That's which right. will be connected by the... That's right. Thank you. Anybody else, guys? Okay, hi. Sorry. Go ahead. Is there any specific uh, deployment um, uh, component need to be installed in server side? Yes. Uh, can you? Oh, you mean uh, you mean uh, four widgets? Yes. No, I mean uh, the, the the components that you need are things like Apache, uh, maybe PHP if you use that, or Python, or uh, Java, JavaScript, uh, I mean JavaScript, uh, or or Java. Any of those things that you do on the server side, you can uh, you do that. It's just like building your own uh, web application, okay. right? So you don't need anything special like a widget service, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. yeah. So you had a question? Go ahead. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> there aren't too many emulators for you to actually test uh, widgets. Sorry. Right. No, but see, the thing is, um, if you, I mean, so that is definitely a good point, but you know, you can't test things like, for example, I want to buzz the phone. So there's an API to buzz the phone. So, so the point is that you, there are some emulators that do certain things. You can test all your JavaScript functionality in, uh, in your uh, browser, you can maybe test using Opera, some of the things, but you, I mean, if you want to uh, build a widget, where let's say for example, on the N95, you build a widget and you want to, um, you want to actually buzz, like let's say you're building an IPL widget, and every time there's a six or a four, you want to play the, the team's song, let's say, and you use some poly, uh, polyphonic, uh, uh, you know, um, sound APIs to actually, um, you know, say that, you know, to play that song. There's no way you can actually test it except on a phone. Hmm. So you want to use the mic? The, you, you, there are uh, approximations that, you know, like uh, if you're clever, you can get away with all of these things, right? So, so definitely it shouldn't uh, hinder any of you from building widgets. But there is, there is definitely a business opportunity where uh, emulators need to be built. Okay, for widget. So, for, I mean, there aren't that many emulators that actually support widget development today. Yeah. If you want to build a, let's say, a mobile location specific widget, is there any specific API? Uh, sorry? Could you, could you clarify? I, who, who is it? I can't see you, first of all. Oh, okay, hi. Is there any specific API you can access to get the mobile location? From my widget, right. So the the, the widget um, runtimes are providing such APIs. Um, uh, 
uh, into JavaScript so that using JavaScript, you will be able to get those sorts of uh, information. Like as you're moving, you'll get a callback with a, from an NMEA compliant GPS device so that you know your current location. Um, so all of these sorts of APIs are things that, uh, that are either in development or uh, coming up in the next release and those sorts of things. You know, you will have some widget platforms that already support that on certain, certain devices. Um, but definitely all of that is in the realm of what is, uh, what is planned for widgets over the next few years. Questions, let's take it offline, guys. I think um, I'm done. And uh, thank you very much for all your time. Okay?